We've just crossed the Cider River and we're entering really what's the most historic part of the Columbus area, Franklinton, the west side of the river. Settled in 1797, so it predates Columbus by about 15 years. And there are a few historic buildings left. We're passing the Harrison headquarters, said to be the headquarters of William Henry Harrison, our famously short-lived U.S. president from Ohio, during the War of 1812 while he was commanding military units. And behind it is the Lucas Sullivan Land Office. Sullivan was a surveyor for the United States government and sold off land parcels in this area from that little brick building. As we head west on Broad Street and begin to head up the hill out of the Scioto River Valley, the hilltop on the right side, the north side of the uh, old National Road, West Broad Street, is where the State Hospital for the Insane was built in 1877. It was an enormous building and dominated the hilltop and was a reason that uh, part of this area developed fairly quickly. As we visit this area, we're going to meet with an expert on the history of uh, the Old State Hospital. Hello, Gary. Hi, Jeff, how you doing? Oh, just fine, good to see good you. Good to see you, you? I'm yeah. doing just fine. Well, I'd love to hear the story of the Old State Hospital. Well, you know, it's an amazing story. A lot of people don't realize that this actually was the second hospital. The okay. first one was downtown uh, between Washington Avenue and Parsons. It was built in 1838. Okay. Uh, legislation passed in 35 to build a new one. This was a facility for people with mental Mental, mental was disabilities. A, uh, the word was lunatic asylum. Yeah, those like are all that. kind of pejorative terms today, but they were clinical terms. In they those were days. they were the, you yeah. know terms of the day back yeah. in then. Yeah. You know, it sounds kind of callous nowadays, but that's the way yeah, it was. Well, tragically, in 1868, the building caught far. So after the building burned down, they tried to rebuild it, and they decided not to. They purchased land here from uh, William Sullivan Estate. He okay. was the son of Lucas Sullivan. Right, one yes. Of his sons. Right. They purchased it for $100,000, like 304 acres. It was built on a design uh, called the Kirkbride design, okay. named after Thomas Kirkbride. He was one of the founding members of the American uh, Psychiatric Association. And what did that design involve? Design, it, it started like a big center area and everything branched out to it so you could add wings into the hospital. Okay. Then the center part would go straight back. Now, I think so, I read until construction of the Pentagon during World War II, this was the largest building in the country under a single roof? Under a single roof. That it was the largest building. It was really yeah, something. Yeah. Well, and it was a really prominent building. How many stories was it? It was pretty It tall. was actually about four stories. Residents were on like three floors. They had living quarters for everybody, like the doctors, the superintendent and everything. In this heyday, it was kind of like a little city within the city. It was self-sufficient, had its own power system. It had its ice house, uh, piggeries and chicken houses, <laughs> you know, greenhouses and everything. Well, so. would people living here, they would work in those places? Yeah, a li lot of patients people. did work here mm -hmm. until roughly around about the uh, late 70s and 80s, the patient rights system came in. So we had to uh, do away a lot of patient labor, but you yeah. know. This must have been a major source of employment for people, too. Once it was built, I'm sure there were many people yeah, working here. Yeah, I would say that most of them probably lived out here on the west side. And that would have had and to help develop on the, the west side. The economy on the west side, you know. People everything. moving here, people building businesses. Yeah, when I started to work here, there was a lots of people that still walked to work mm -hmm. and everything sure. and sure. stuff like that. And it yeah. lasted until? The last bit of it was tore down in 1991. Okay. One of the downfalls, I believe, of the hospital's demise was it wasn't taken care of and everything. It just deteriorated and everything. Yeah, sometimes public entities aren't necessarily the best stewards. So it's important, isn't it, to preserve information like this in the memory of a place like this? Oh, yes. It's, it's important to, be, to keep all history alive. I mean, they had nowhere to go. We, we as the employees took care of the patients. Uh, you may not like it in the past what they did, but it was part of history. We can't change history. Well, it's hard to know where you're going if you don't know where you're coming from. Right. The state hospitals are part of the, our history. Part of our story. History. Well, I want to thank you for telling me so much. And, and you're quite welcome. Really enlightening me about a really important institution. You're, you're more than welcome. And I have to head off to Westgate Park and look at some more of the hilltops. So okay. Many thanks. Okay. Talk Take to you again it. sometime. All right. Bye. Be good. Okay. Hi, Dave. How are you? It's good to meet you, Jeff. Good to meet you. Thanks so much for having me out today to learn about Westgate. Well, thanks for coming out. Well, we're here in the park, 
and it's obviously wonderful open space, but yes. this must have been wild land at one point. <laughs> Tell me <laughs> about the history of development here. Okay, well, the, the, the west side, it started out as land that Lucas Sullivan held uh, mm -hmm. not long after the Revolutionary War. He was mm -hmm. the, the founder of Franklinton, right. and actually he owned a lot of this land. In fact, where we are now was owned by one of his sons. There wasn't a whole lot of development for a number of years until actually about the time of the Civil War. We had a couple of camps downtown or near downtown, but they weren't large enough to hold all the troops that were going to be mustering in. So actually what started development out here was Camp Chase. Okay. Where over 100,000 Union troops got their start here at Camp Chase. And, and actually, not only was it a Union mustering center and training ground, it also then became a Civil War prisoner of war camp for Confederate soldiers. And we still have the one remnant of Camp Chase is, of course, the Confederate Cemetery right, yeah. uh, that, that exists over on 2900 Sullivan Avenue. Now, I'm assuming the park was created and then housing developed around it. Is that a correct assumption? It was a combination of both. The, the West Side community really began to expand after the big flood of 1913 that right. pretty much altered the course of Franklinton's history. So it washed them kind of uphill to the hilltop. Yeah, ex exactly, and, exactly. To put it crudely. And folks were, had gradually migrated in this direction as Columbus had grown, but it was, of course, after that that it, you really saw the development out here. So, well, getting so, down to things that I look at, tell me about some of your historic architecture. Okay. The two most notable items of, of architecture would be these. First of all, the Great Western Shopping Center, which was a Don Casto development, used to have the Great Walk of Wonders. And then the other is the actual structure of West High School, which was built in 1929. And the school was developed as a prototype for American high schools. And the architect of the high school was none other than Howard Dwight Smith, Right. who, of course, is the same individual who designed Ohio Stadium. Right. Was there a yeah. lot of development during World War II? Because there's a lot of West Side industrial development, isn't right. there? But that industrial development occurred just after World War II. Three major employers came to the West Side. There was General Motors, which was the biggest. At one time, there were over 6,000 good paying jobs that the plant over on Georgesville Road. There was also the Westinghouse plant and Westinghouse employed just over 3,000 people at its peak. And then finally the third was International Harvester and that employed over 1,000 people at its peak. So between the three of them, they provided 10,000 really good blue collar type jobs for the west side. Now that's changed because yes. none of those plants is still here. That's exactly I mean, the buildings right. might be, but they aren't the same businesses. Well, I'm guessing they don't have the same level of employment. That's, and that's exactly right. And that's made it very, very difficult economically for a good portion of, 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 of the west side of Columbus. The GM plant was completely leveled and they completely redid the grounds there. And obviously that's a brand new building. And that's provided about a thousand jobs out here but that's not the same as 6,000. Well, do you find people moving in because they see it as a desirable neighborhood, even if they work elsewhere? Yeah. People are pretty mobile these days. Well, that's, this, this is true. And the one really good thing about the west side of Columbus and the Hilltop area is that is it affordable by most people. Number two is it's accessible. It's close to everything. I mean, we're literally we're less than a 10 minute drive from downtown. And what we've seen are, is this become very much an immigrant community as well simply because the housing is affordable. So it has become now also very much an immigrant community, well, as well as a community of folks who've been here for generations. I've learned so much about the neighborhood, <laughs> and thank you so much for uh, coming out oh, and telling me about sure, it. Sure, sure. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, my pleasure.